talk about, uh, there's a wonderful paper um, by uh, John Marshall on, on metaphors for the mind. Um, and of course, you all know this stuff. So there was hydraulic metaphors uh, back in the Greeks. Um, think about depression and repression and all the words that Freud used are all basically hydraulic. Stores of objects with memory chambers, you know, the idea of how you memorize things, you stick things in the chambers of the memory. Clockworks were huge, electricity, railways and telephone switches when they came forward. Basically, the point is that when new technologies got developed, people thought, oh goodness, maybe that's how the mind works. Some more thoughtful people thought, you know, that's how the mind works, and that's why we invented telephones and <laughs> railways and so on and so forth. Um, strings and pulleys, the last meditation of Descartes, it's wonderful, he talks about the nerves. It's not too bad, except the nerves are actually strings, and you pull them through the tube, and the foot moves and stuff. Um, and then the computer. Now, the computer was different in terms of its intellectual impact as a possible um, model of mind. It was taken very seriously theoretically. And the question is why? And I think there's a reason, and I want to try to explain that reason. So to explain it, we have to go back to Descartes again and to the emergence of science, basically, and the philosophy of mechanism. So in the age of alchemy, there were spirits, there were trees, there were you know ants and so on and so forth. Um, there was rationality, there was having orgasms and stuff. Having an idea and having an orgasm were sort of thought to be the same. It's really wondrous stuff, the hermetic method. But then Descartes came along and kind of sorted things out. And he separated the realms of mechanism and the realms of meaning, I think, because he understood how he could actually theorize mechanism. And he didn't understand how he could theorize meaning. So it was kind of a division of labor. I actually think that this is a more important dualism in Descartes than the mind-body one. I mean, of course, the body is a mechanism according to him, and the mind is meaningful. But it was really meaning and mechanism that he was actually separating. And the realm of meaning. You know, he includes things of language and symbols and so on and so forth in there. And uh, mechanism forces, causes, all the stuff we know from mechanics and then dynamics and then chemistry and physical stuff and so on and so forth. Um, our thoughts, our language, our symbols and so on and so forth are about this world. That's what Descartes was doing. He was coming up with meditations which were in the top realm about things in the bottom realm by and large. You could, of course, think about meaning too, recursively, but this was the basic picture. Um, there was a little problem for Descartes. Um, so then he gets an A minus on the test. He didn't explain how these two worlds interact. How if the mind was there, it could interact with the world of physical stuff. That's called the problem of mental causation in philosophy. Um, and I believe one of the most signal achievements in intellectual life in the last 200 years is basically a solution to that problem that was proposed in the foundations of logic. Um, and so I want to kind of tell you about that. So I want to tell you what logic is. One way logic is after I introduced is sort of like this. I actually think that's not a very useful. If you know how to read that stuff, then you know how to read that stuff. I'm not going to tell you anything. And if you don't know how to read that stuff, then I'm not going to tell you anything either, because it would fail. I think we need to understand the fundamental idea by logic. And I think this is really important, because I think it's been lost. So what's the fundamental idea? The fundamental idea is that reasoning, thought, derivation, language, and so on and so forth are enacted through a system of symbols. So here we have symbols. I got them in a mind, but they could be in a theorem proof or a machine. That represent the world that the reasoning is about. Planetary motion or let's have for breakfast or whatever. There are two relationships between and among the symbols and between them and the world. And they're both critical and they've got to be coordinated. Um, there are causal relationships. Now, they're sometimes called formal relationships, but I've actually spent 30 years trying to understand what formal means. And I actually think I could go to court and argue that actually the notion of syntactic formality is, is, is can be derived from the laws of, of physics. Um, so I've indicated those things on this page with single red arrows. And there's another relationship of aboutness. If I have a thought, I have a thought about the party you're going to invite us all to tomorrow night, or about um, you know, the first female president, who I don't even know who it is, but I can still think about her because I want to give her my best wishes, and so on and so forth. Um, so I've indicated in here with two blue double arrows. And 
The point is that this structure, which was worked out in the context of logic, I believe applies to all representational technology. So this is a hugely general basic picture, which got to be complicated in a zillion ways. But the basic idea, remember we're still talking about the fundamental idea, is that to work properly, the systems, the symbols in the system have to remain appropriately coordinated with the world they refer to. Otherwise you're going to be wrong, for example. That means that logic and all representational systems are governed by norms. So if I come up with a logic in my Olaf is teaching my logic course, and I say, hey, look, I've got a great new logic. Here's how it works. And Olaf points out, look, everything this thing's coming up with was false. And I said, you're just so prejudicial. What's wrong with falsehood? <laughs> logic is not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary symbol manipulation. There's actually this background condition in logical systems that you actually are trying to uh, represent, get these things coordinated. And uh, the representation be true is one of the most obvious norms. People who know logic will know about soundness and completeness. Soundness and completeness are technical versions of those norms in the formal structure of logic. But this is what matters. There's a norm. Moreover, having semantics, being about things, and being subject with respect to how you work to those relationships to what it's about, I actually think are the confining properties, the stuff and substance of mind and language. I actually don't think you have a mind or have a language unless you have those properties. Because, in fact, this is what allows us to refer to things that are distal, the party I referred to, or, in fact, Einstein drive out there, or, or anything. In fact, I don't think you can think without actually thinking about something. And what it is that you think about isn't necessarily here. We actually have a sense of the world. And furthermore, the structure of these norms and the structure of the coordination determines whether what we say is true and false, which at the moment seems to be a rather important subject matter, which might be something my house would be interested in knowing what's what is truth and how does that work and so on and so forth. I should say I'm a social constructionist of a certain uh, to, to a certain extent. So this doesn't mean naive realism. It just means there's a world out there. Moreover, and I want to emphasize this, I think the most important property of human and logical semantics and reasoning and so on and so forth is that it's deferential. This should have been in italics. We defer to what's the case. If, as the philosophers say, if word and world part company, the world wins, and I'm wrong. I actually um, specialize in being wrong because it's an experience I have a great deal. Um, and I think the point about being wrong is I want to know if that's a pond that is 17 miles deep. And my guess is it's not. And so if I say it's 17 miles deep, people will think, why did I invite this guy? because he said something false. Because what actually matters is how deep the pond is. So that deference, and I think it underwrites artistic creativity and so on and so forth, that deference to how the world is, namely the deference to what it is that our thoughts are about, I think is in fact foundational in logic. And the thing that is most important for Weihaus and for my talk here today and so on and so forth is that these semantic relations and the norms of truth and reference and the deference and so on and so forth, none of them are causal relations. You can't express what's going on, what the norms are, what things are about in purely causal terms. So I'll just tell you about this iPhone app I tell my students about. I say, look, if you could build this iPhone app, you can earn a billion dollars. I mentioned this when I was here last time. Um, if you can't earn a billion dollars, you can take my life because I'm sure God will tell you you can't build it. And the iPhone app is the following. You download the iPhone app, you put it on your iPhone, and turn it on, and then your iPhone will beep every time anyone thinks about you. Now, I think that would cater to a large amount of <laughs> ego in the world. But the thing is, when you're thought about, you are actually thought about, but nothing causally impinges on you. You can't have a being thought about detector, because it's not a causal property. It's not a causally efficacious property, I would say, if I was thinking, talking more carefully. And I think that fact, that the properties of thought and language which are most important are not causally detectable, means the following. That you can't understand logic completely within 
contemporary science because contemporary science is committed to causal explanation. More, I think, I mean, philosophers of science will say that, but I think more than, in fact, some scientists realize how profound the philosophy of mechanism that came out of the, emerged from alchemy, is actually committed to a kind of causal account of how thinking and mind and waterfalls and so on and so forth work. So I think the point is that this fact about logic, that it's governed by semantic norms, which are not themselves causal relationships, means that the actual theory of logic can't actually be given a causal explanation. And of course, I wouldn't be saying this if we were talking about logic. I think this is true about mind. I think it's true of awareness. I think it's true of consciousness. I also think it's true of computing. I'd, I will actually go to back to argue that the things that get called theories of computation are actually inadequate in that they don't get at what actually matters about computation, which is that it's a normally normatively governed configuration of machine states that actually are meant to correspond to the world in, in, in semantic ways, and that the semantic ways and the normal normative coordination and so on and so forth. Every programmer knows that, but the theories don't account for it. All right. So that was this great idea of logic, I think. You work causally, and the way you work is governed by norms that are semantic, and the semantic norms are not themselves causal. All right, what about computing? Let's go back to the picture we had. As the world went on, mechanical, you know, causal scientific accounts of things started to be more and more impressive, and started to take over things that were actually previously thought to be in this realm. So if you think of George Boole's Stuff in the middle of the 19th century, um, Frege uh, attempted to derive logic from mathematics, but then what came out of that, um, essentially formal logic. And I think this is a kind of, what do we call it, just so story? I'm not sure people know what just so stories mean anymore, but basically rationalizations that aren't quite right, but they give a sense of what's going on. What I think happened is that intellectual life, because we started to understand things about theory and language and symbols, it got kind of brought within science. And I think that computing actually arose, so this is the 37 paper of Turing in the 50s, uh, what is, uh, it's 1950, what's the Turing 50 paper called? Anyway, whatever it's called. Game? Sorry? The Imitation Game? Well, it's about the Imitation Game. I don't what think that's its that? name. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, whatever it's called. I'm referring to it, <laughs> and I defer to it, whatever it is called. <laughs> I think computation arises out of that. Here is a striking fact. Think about computer science's technical vocabulary. Symbol, reference, language, name, identifier, variable, syntax, uh, semantics, evaluation, interpretation, and so on and so forth. All of these words are words that come from the study of logic, which was the upper thread in this picture. Those words aren't like force or mass or acceleration or charge or anything like that. They're not words from the realm of causal physical stuff. They're words from the realm of language and symbols and reasoning and thought and so on and so forth. But what happened, I think, is that because of this insertion, computer science actually redefined all those words to name the causal mechanical relations. Now, you might think that what it did was it came up with mechanical accounts of these phenomena, but I don't think that's right. I think it actually changed the subject. And I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, so what that's led to, I think, is the following. So I wrote my, I don't know if I mentioned this, I wrote my first eight big AI program um, 50 years ago this October. So I'm basically an agent and about to go extinct. Um, when I started, AI was based on essentially a logical model. Good old fashioned AI, that's what my old friend John Hoagland called, called it. GoFi, that became the, the universal word. It basically was based on this deferential model that the syntax had to honor the semantics and so on and so forth. You had this dialectic. GoFi failed. My own view is it failed because, it's of because of its excessively rigid ontology, not because this fundamental model is wrong. But the problem was, people threw away the baby with the bathwater, as always happens. And the two things happened. One is that the AI students and the cognitive science students that I teach in Toronto 
a lot of them are anti-representational pretty profoundly. But the thing that I find more trying is that even those who use the semantical vocabulary, as I mentioned, mean different things. They actually mean things in the realm of mechanism. So I can't tell them, I can't say, look, I think we need to consider the semantics of this system because the notion of semantics is used up in computer science for the relationship between the program and the process that results. And so therefore, I don't know what to say. I can say the semantics of the semantics of the program, but that doesn't always work. Um, it's kind of interesting. I also, when I was in graduate school in the early 70s, I, I wrote a little dialect of Lisp which had a model of reflection in it, which is a topic I'm still interested in, as are other people here. What could it be to actually construct a system that was able to reason about itself? The notion of aboutness, that it was reflective, was the notion of aboutness that I think real aboutness is, which is a non-causal denotative relationship to the self. And I actually arranged the causal, namely how the program worked, to honor this semantical account. And it was profoundly not understood. And I, for a long time, I didn't understand why. I mean, it could have been a bad idea, but it was profoundly misunderstood. And I couldn't figure that out until I figured out that the word semantics and denotation and reference and all of those words, which I had picked up from you know, philosophy of mind and logic and so on and so forth, had actually been redefined within the causal <coughs> sphere. And what's happened, I think, and I'm going to close with this, is something I call blanket mechanism. This is my word. You, I, don't, I don't think anyone else uses it. But anyway, you, I just want you to know what I mean by it. So it's not just a commitment to scientific explanation. That would be a commitment that everything can actually be causally explained. It's a stronger thesis, and it's held a priori in the sense that the people I encountered actually believe it without having any evidence for it, that everything that exists is causal, that in fact the world is restricted to the causal, not just that explanation is restricted, is, is, is not just the causal explanation is capable of explaining everything, including reference, but that there is no such thing as reference. And I tell you, when I teach about reference and I get people to realize how stunning it is, they all decide there's no such thing. And it's amazing. I tell them, well, look, you just met somebody three weeks ago, and you fall in love with them, and their high school sweetheart turns off, and they go off to Hawaii for four days or five days, and you're a total psychological wreck, and the person comes back, and you're just a mess, and you go see them, and you say, did you think about me while I'm gone? And the person says, well, I don't know. There's no such thing as thinking about but my cortical cells moved around in this way, and so on and so forth. And I try to get them <laughs> just drenched in anxiety. But they still won't believe in reverence. And also, I think, and this is what's interesting, I think even in the discussions this morning, my sense is that the words we use, like what's an observable phenomenon, and what's behavior, and what's information, and what's emergence in data, and what's operational things in themselves, evidence events, all of those words have been drenched, have been uh, dyed in blanket mechanisms, so they now refer, so an event is only the causal physical phenomena. It isn't doesn't include the semantical stuff, the truth, and so on and so forth. Um, the truth of a phenomenon is not the thing in itself, and so on. And I think observable stuff, so science studies people, they want to take video cameras, and Bruno Latour writes a book, Pandora's box. box. Is it called Pandora's box? Anyway, he has this stuff at the beginning. I mean, it, it's so obvious if you go box, I decided it wasn't. <laughs> And he says, look, he's at the edge of this field in Brazil, and he has a video camera, and people are putting little samples of Earth into egg crates, and they're putting little plastic things. He doesn't see any reference there. He just sees patterns of circulating signal bars. And I say to Bruno, of course you don't see reference. Reference isn't causal. It's not going to impinge on the digital detector in your video camera. The fact that it doesn't detect on the sensor in your digital camera just means it's not a causally efficacious phenomenon. It doesn't mean it's not there. So anyway, I think those have all been torqued. Just in case you didn't know what I thought about blanket mechanism, I thought it would give you a little hint. <laughs> and so here's my moral for my house. I think that we should be aware of blanket mechanism. We should not be a priori committed to thinking that causal explanations of things will do justice to our phenomena. Because my sense is that awareness and consciousness and thinking about things and so on and so forth all partake of that lesson 
that was worked out in the formal context of logic that these things are not causal phenomena. And so I think if we inadvertently come into molecular mechanism, we'll never understand awareness. Thank you. Thank you.